Hello everyone, I'm Linda Nickel and welcome to the Happiness Hour. Every week, photographers meet here to connect, inspire, and create. My guests share an insight into their creative journeys and inspire us to try something new. If you'd like to join us live, you'll find the schedule for upcoming sessions on my website at lindanickel.com. Tonight's guest is David Cook. David is a nature photographer based in Austin. His training as a Texas master naturalist and his affinity to explore the great outdoors inspires him to connect with the natural world. But his work as a photographer sparks and nurtures a sense of wonder in his audience. David has a long list of exhibitions and award credits that include the Florida Museum of Photographic Arts, Dallas Center for Photography, Art Square New York, and the Glasgow Gallery of Photography, and that's just naming a few. In tonight's presentation, The Evolution and Inspirations of a Nature Photographer, David will trace his evolution from simple snapshots to expressive gallery awarded nature photography and what inspired him along the way. He will discuss major creative and technical steps along his path, and he'll introduce you to his recent exhibition, Avian Apparitions. If you're on Instagram, you can find him at David J. Cook 10, and you can connect with him through his website, davidjcookphotography.com. Welcome to the Happiness Hour, David. Sorry about that little stumble on your intro. I'll go back in there and fix it. No problem. <laughs> All right. Uh, I, and you know, I always like, I feel like Sometimes I just skim and I don't really like, you know, find all the good stuff. So if there's something that I missed, please feel free to fill in the blanks and introduce yourself, you know, um, and, and before you get started or if you're ready to go, you're like, I, I, I'm ready to go. And th thank all of you. Uh, thank everyone else for uh, uh, joining in. Let me go ahead and get started here. Um and as Linda pointed out, that's um, my website, davidjcookphotography.com, um, and my email, davidjcook at gmail. And I didn't put my Instagram on here, but that's uh, at davidjcook10. Um, so when I was thinking a little bit about um, this talk, uh, I was reminded about some art exhibits that I've gone to that really, really spoke to me and that I enjoyed. And I, I went to one recently um, out at the Wheelwright Museum of Native American art in Santa Fe. And both my wife and I are really big, huge fans of a, 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 a Navajo painter named Tony Abeda. Uh, he's part of a family, his father, Narciso Abeda, and his sister, whose name I forget, were all artists. And this exhibit was about their work. But what really um, fascinated with me was you got to see the evolution of their work from Tony Abeda's first painting when he was 17 years old to his work today and his father's work um, over a 50 year time span. So I'm certainly not in that league of artists, but I, I like this idea of trying to show a journey that, that someone has been on. So that's what I'm gonna talk a little bit about. And I'm gonna start with my inspiration. Um, this is from Rachel Carson's book, uh, The Sense of Wonder. And everyone knows Rachel Carson for Sil from Silent Spring, but this is a book that she wrote for her uh, grandnephew called The Sense of Wonder. It said, if I had the influence with the good fairy who's supposed to preside over the christening of all children, I should ask that her gift to each child be a sense of wonder so indestructible that it would last throughout life as an unfailing antidote against the boredom and disenchantments of later years, the sterile preoccupation with things that are artificial, the alienation from the sources of our strength. And that's what I I hope that my photography is about, is trying to instill a sense of wonder um, in others. So my sort of my journey began as what I would call sort of a, a simple landscape photographer taking snapshots. And I'm gonna put in some of these quotes that um, inspired me throughout the way. Uh, keep close to nature's heart and break clear once in a while and climb a mountain or spend a week in the woods. Wash your spirit clean. And that's what a lot of these early photographs 
um, that I took. Um, all of these were post-digital career. So these began probably about 20 years ago. I did shoot film early on, but not generally nature photography. Um, what was common with a lot of this er these early photos is I call them my postcard series. We went to national parks, we went to, to beautiful places. Inevitably, I was there at two o'clock in the afternoon and I took a photograph that everybody else took at that time. Um, so I like these um, because I love these places, um, but they're not sort of different or, or, or inspiring photos, but I keep them around to sort of remind me that I love these places. None of these particular photographs did I work for. Like I said, we went to some place. If I was there at nine o'clock in the morning and it was a perfectly clear sky, that's what I took. Um, if it was cloudy, that's what I took. And then we drove off someplace else. This, however, is my first landscape photo that was sort of an exception to that. So this is um, in Monument Valley. And this is um, from Hunts Mesa. And the way that you have to get here is you have to hire um, guides from the Navajo Reservation. You drive out to the Mesa. We camped there overnight and got up in the morning to be able to take this particular shot over Monument Valley. It's, the, it's a different view. Um, and several people that I knew at that time had arranged this. And um, we camped out there at Hunts Mesa. And it was one of the coldest nights that I can remember. It, it, it wasn't really that bad, but it just felt so cold. Um, this is a photograph I took at a workshop in New Mexico, and I, I, I liked it just because it was different. That's Pedernal um, in the background, Georgia O'Keeffe always painted. But this is um, across the highway from that and a red rock area that I just got really close to these red rocks and ha had that in the background. Aspens in Santa Fe. And then when um, I began to, to sort of experiment with black and white um, in some of these landscapes, and I really enjoyed the landscape of uh, White Sands and Great Sand Dunes National Monument. So these were a couple of black and white shots of those sand dunes. Again, classic landscape stuff. Now, I've always been a sucker for waterfalls. So as part of my landscape, I... I, I just will go any place to see waterfalls. And this quote from Thoreau um, inspired me. The finest workers in stone are not copper or steel tools, but the gentle touches of air and water working at their leisure with a liberal allowance of time. So these waterfalls, Nevada Falls in Yosemite. So this particular waterfall is in the Olympic Peninsula and there's a story behind this. So um, it's 2005. And I got my first digital SLR. It was a Nikon D70 and boy, was I proud of it. I was so happy and excited about it. I got it in probably May of 2005. And two months later, I am at this waterfall, brought my tripod and I knew I wanted to take a slow exposure to have the, the water streaming down. And I'm climbing in, in the water, in the creek below this waterfall. And I fall in the, the, fall in the creek. But I was really, really careful. So all of my body got wet, except I had my camera in my left hand. And when I fell, my left hand went up like this. So it got completely out of the water. So there was no damage to the camera whatsoever. Black and white slow motion at Lower Yosemite Falls, Lower Yellowstone Falls, and... Um, you know, Mount Rainier uh, National National Monument. So again, landscape stuff. Then my eye began to, to, I think, narrow in on more intimate parts of the landscape and smaller details. And again, I, Rachel Carson spoke to me. And then there's a world of little things seen all too seldom. Some of nature's most exquisite handiwork is on a miniature scale. So here, rather than just looking at those grand scenes, I began to isolate smaller parts of the landscape. Here's a uh, paintbrush in Zion National um, Park. Um, 
uh, a juniper that's finding a way in, in, in Bandelier National Monument. Details of um, Antelope Canyon in Arizona. Um, I'm gonna mention a photographer at the end, but I wanna um, tell this story now. Uh, his name is Eddie Soloway, and I took a, uh, several of his photo workshops from Santa Fe. And one of the things he said, he said, um, so imagine um, you're, uh, we've taken photos of Antelope Canyon, and a lot of the photos of Antelope Canyon look really similar. And imagine that there were 10 people, and each of you had your photo. If I threw those photos up in the air, could you go find your picture of Antelope Canyon from all the ones that were there? And that really, really struck me. How, how is my work different than anybody else who may have been in this place? So I was trying to get some capture some more details of the patterns um, in that canyon. And again, smaller, more intimate details in the landscape. But also um, focusing on the smaller things, the macro, the, the textures of this leaf in Costa Rica, uh, or the dragonfly, um, bees visiting a buttercup down at the Wildflower Center, and experimenting um, with uh, really up close. This is a peacock feather um, up close. Uh, Katie did visiting a thistle again down at the Wildflower Center. Um, I mentioned earlier that I began to do the fauna survey at the Wildflower Center. Um, and this is a, a blue damselfly that I got there. And um, I, I, a caterpillar, I should know what, what type of caterpillar this is, but I don't, unfortunately. Mika will put it in the chat or someone else who knows. But some of these details um, really, really drew my eye. And then spending time both at the Wildflower Tenor and here in Central Texas, wildflowers began to inspire me, as did Ladybird. My heart found its home long ago in the beauty, mystery, order, and disorder of the flowering earth. So, of course, blue bonnets are um, classic here in Central Texas. Um, this is was actually in the northern peninsula of Michigan, and I took this to represent the bloom. It's a trillium wildflower. But it, it's representing the word bloom on another project that I'm going to talk about a little bit later in my presentation. Um, bluebell, coneflower, bird of paradise. And again, I, I, what I did is I took some of these flowers and brought them inside to a studio and experimented with them. Uh, this is my namesake. You can't really tell, but this one's called Old Man's Beard. So I, I uh, really love this. When it goes to seed, generally in August, the textures um, of this particular plant uh, just really fascinate me. So uh, after I was doing wildflowers, I began to experiment with um, multi-shot imagery. So two, two things, panoramas and HDR. So this was one of my early panoramas. This was actually in um, Red Rock Country in um, northern New Mexico, um, Ghost Ranch area. And then coming back from New Mexico, we actually got um, a full rainbow across the eastern plains of New Mexico. Again, this was, a, I think, a three-shot panorama. In addition, I began to experiment a little bit with HDR. I didn't really like some of the, the really, um, um, what I would call sort of obnoxious and overprocessed HDR, but trying to capture um, more parts of the tonal image. So this was on a photo workshop that I took um, out at Big Bend. Um, this is Sunrise at Santa Elena Canyon. And there's a, a, a little story about this here. I don't know, many of you, some of you have been to Santa Elena Canyon. I, I realize that there's a, people from all over the, the, the country here. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but right here, this, uh, this is the Rio Grande River. This is the U.S. right here, and this is Mexico. There's normally not a creek here. This is called Terlingua Creek, and it's normally dry. Um, but when we went out here, um, we left um, our... Uh, our hotel at about four o'clock in the morning, drove over the Maverick 
uh, highway, which is about a dirt road, about 30 miles to get here. And we got, and the creek had water in it. And it was about waist high, but we waded across the creek so we could get up into the canyon for this sunrise shot. And later on that same trip, experimenting with uh, HDR on the window, which is a um, uh, view in uh, the Chisos Basin in Big Bend National Park. So I really wanted to be, to grab more parts of the tonal image here. So these were each of uh, three different shots that were processed into the, then one single one. So I, I be, at this point, I began to sort of move a little bit more from uh, what I would call landscapes into wildlife. At, at this part, I would call would have called myself primarily a landscape photographer, maybe a nature photographer because I, I had plants um, as well. But here's where I began to experiment with, with birds. And this began, I think, with two things. Number one, I we took a trip to the Galapagos Islands and I got um, the Sigma 150 to 600 zoom lens so I could get close to the birds. And that opened up a new world of photography for me. One reason that birds matter is that they are our last best connection to a natural world that is otherwise receding. So this is not one of my great, great uh, bird ph photographs, but it was an early one I took on the Galapagos with a, a little Nascabooey family um, feeding. And shortly after that, I went down to the valley for the first time and saw a green jay. And, and I was hooked, I think, at that point, both with, uh, with the valley and with uh, with bird photography. We got a couple of hummingbirds here. So an interesting thing, these were in Costa Rica and um, there were scores and scores of hummingbird feeders around this garden. And you've probably you know, seen many, many photographs of hummingbirds on feeders. I didn't want another one of those and, and our guide didn't either. So what he did was he, took down all the feeders and went over to um, these plants and sprayed them with sugar water. So now all the hummingbirds came on all of these blooms rather than feeding on the feeders. So we were able to get these shots without feeders. In them. I really liked this osprey um, in black and white as opposed to in color because it was a, just a, a plain blue sky. I love the Mayfield Preserve here in Austin, Texas, and it's a, a garden, but it all, they also have peacocks. So every year I go to shoot the peacocks there. And um, roseate spoonbills. I, I, I love roseate spoonbills. It's probably my favorite bird. Um, I spent about 30 minutes working on this one down at the South Padre Island Birding Center. Uh, snowy egret. Uh, fishing at McKinney Falls. And what was fun about this picture is this was taken in May of 2021, I believe. Um, one year later, I went back to the same spot, the same weekend, and I saw a snowy egret fishing in the same spot. I don't know if it was the same snowy egret, but he was in the same location. Whooping cranes down at the uh, um, Aransas National Wildlife Refuge. And our native uh, endangered golden cheek warbler. So, uh, as I was able to get closer to these birds with my longer lens, they became sort of a, a, a more important part of my photography. And I spent more time photographing birds. Um, this um, galnule was fine, but um, at the birding center in, in Port Aransas, there's a large alligator that lives there and he comes out and there's just hundreds and hundreds of birds. And I've never seen him go after one of the birds, but staring down this particular alligator, we were all looking at him, uh, wondering what was going on. Um, this, you know, local hummingbird here down at the Wildflower Center. I really like this photograph. I, we go to, um, Mueller Lake, which is here in Austin, Texas. And there are um, a variety of ducks and also domestic uh, geese. And this goose had just come up out of the water and the water was um, uh, dripping from his eye like he was in tears. My close-up of Athena, who is the great horned owl at the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, a uh, 
great blue heron reflection. And the number of ones from uh, Bosque del Apache, where I've gone the past couple of years to shoot the sandhill cranes, but in this case, scores and scores of red winged blackbirds flocking. But as I mentioned, the sandhill cranes there, tricolored heron scratching his itch, and more, a couple more sandhill cranes from Bosque del Apache. So um, I really, and I continue to shoot birds um, a lot. Um, but I've, I've tried to find new ways to do that. And I'm going to kind of move toward, um, what I would call some more experimentational work that I've done with my photography. So this particular photograph, um, is one that I kept. It was an accident. I was at the Zilker Botanical Garden and the wind was blowing and I had autofocus and it didn't focus. And this is what came up and these were tulips. But this particular photograph to me said spring. I love the colors and I love the faint shape. So I kept this photograph and said, what happens if I do something different? A number of people I'm going to talk about at the end uh, um, have sort of inspired me to also try different things with my photography. And this also was a, a turning point to try some new things. So I began experimenting with, with selective focus. These were um, wildflowers here thrown out of focus. And then I decided to experiment. So what would happen, this happens to be a Texas thistle. And um, it was in a studio and I had a long exposure. So just for a second, um, close your eyes and imagine you're focusing close on a flower. Now, manually turn your focus ring. And what happens to the image? It becomes blurry, obviously. So what I tried to do here was during a long exposure, I actually um, began the photo in focus and over a six second exposure turn the focus ring so this is a combination of a texas thistle both in focus and thrown out of focus during one exposure i could have done this in photoshop but a lot of the things that i tried to experiment with i like doing them in, in camera um, so i i try things in camera first similar thing this is a uh, called a tie vine, which is a purple flower um, that's blooming even now here. Begin in focus, long exposure, in focus for about two seconds, turn the manual focus to throw it out of focus to create this sort of aura around the flower. And I thought it was an interesting effect that I liked and I experimented it with um, a, a couple of different things. Dandelions were one of them. So I, I was working on a project where I needed to take some pictures of dandelions and I tried all sorts of different um, angles, getting low, shooting um, one dan you know, dandelion um, in bloom, shot through another in seed, what um, uh, Victor Nabokov called the, the, the sun and the moon um, of the dandelion. Again, this is two dandelions. You can see the one in the background. The first one is just a dandelion in seed, but it's in the foreground and I'm focusing behind it. So it's entirely uh, blown out and fuzzy. But the texture of that, black and white. And then try an in-camera multiple exposures. Again, this is a dandelion in, in, in seed and one in bloom with the ant crawling on it. But this is actually just two in-camera multiple exposures. So I began to play with those as well, multiple exposures. And um, I experimented with the, the sable palms and the peacocks at um, Mayfield Preserve that I mentioned earlier. I love the, the fan shape of the palm set against the peacock. 
And again, birds. So in this case, I'm doing a multiple exposure of a blue winged teal coming in for a landing. And this to me showed the motion of it better than just stopping, stopping that bird in flight at a, um, a high shutter speed. And then like, like lots of people, I tried um, moving my camera, um, uh, ICM, which most of you have heard of, intentional camera movement, has um, become popular. Trees and aspens. Different motion of wildflowers spinning the camera. Uh, redwoods out at Big Sur. But I, I, you know, it seemed to me that so much of the intentional camera movement examples that I saw were um, a lot of really similar stuff. Trees are great, and I love doing that. I was taking a workshop um, on motion with uh, Eddie Soloway again, and I was walking down a path in the woodlands uh, where my, my mom lives in Texas. And I didn't move the camera. I tried to keep the camera as still as I could holding it in front of me. But I walked down the path and took a two-second shutter exposure. So I began a series of what I called IFM, intentional feet movement. So rather than moving my camera, I would walk down a trail and be as still as I could with the camera, but have the motion of my body through the landscape create that effect. And this was the very first one that I tried like that. And I keep it around sort of as a reminder of that. Um, this was one, and actually um, um, Linda mentioned um, I won um, an award for uh, abstract photography at the Florida Museum of Photographic Arts last year. This is in Grand Staircase Escalante. These, the green, I'm sorry, the yellow are cottonwoods and these greens are um, horsetail ferns walking down the Calf Creek Trail. So again, I'm just walking down that. It's about a two second exposure. Uh, I love Chaco Canyon. And many of you have probably seen this sort of iconic photo of all the doors in Chaco Canyon. And I have you know, numerous photos like that. Last time I was out there, I said, what, what would happen if I began walking through those doors with a long exposure of uh, four to six seconds? So I extended my intentional feet movement through that archaeological landscape. This was actually down at um, Lady Bird Lake um, about this time of year last year, the bald cypress were beginning to, to turn bronze. So this was just walking toward some fall colors and um, walking down a trail here in Bull Creek again in, in fall. So all of these series, my IFM series for intentional feet movement, I encourage you to try it. It's it's fun. You you're outside walking anyway. Um, see what happens with it. Uh, one more um, IFM with some fall color down along Bull Creek. And I my last um, sort of ex, um, focus exposure um, game or experiment. So like many people, I shot the um, recent um, annual, annual eclipse here in October, and I got, you know, some good shots. But I, while I was shooting, I also said, what happens to the sun and the moon if I throw this out of focus? So this is the recent solar eclipse thrown out of focus. I loved it. So yeah, I, I made my own little heart. Birds have wings, they're free. They have the kind of mobility many people envy. So as I began to shoot more birds, I asked myself this question, um, how do my bird photograph, how do my bird photographs differ from other people's? And um, I was inspired again by some people who said, what if, while I'm doing my photographs, what if I move the camera? What if I try to show slutter speed? What if I throw things out of focus. So this was the very beginning of a whole series that I've done um, on uh, birds in flight called avian apparitions. 
And this was my very first one down at South Padre Island. And I liked both the ghost-like image that it creates of the birds and the way that it, some of them invoke motion. So these are a couple of early examples of my avian apparitions. And all I'm doing here is shooting the bird at a relatively show, slow shutter speed, generally one eighth to one tenth of a second, and I'm panning. Um, I'm not going to get, you know, generally if you would pan, you do sort of 120th, 130th, or 140th, so you get um, more of the bird in focus. I very specifically was not trying to do that to um, in, uh, evoke more of the motion and in some ways the, the ballet like feeling of flight. This was actually a great tailed grackle um, on a cloudy morning. So grackles are not photogenic birds. Cloud, cloudy morning is not a great time, but I was able to, to get some of these shots of different birds. So these were kind of my early experiments with this. This was um, a sandhill crane that I shot at Bosque del Apache. And this was the, my very first photograph that I got accepted into an exhibit um, at the uh, Dallas Mus uh, Center for Photography, which has since closed down. They had an exhibit uh, two years ago. It was called In Motion. And I said, hey, I've got some photographs of birds in motion. Why don't I submit some? And this one was selected. And I was so excited. Uh, and then they said, okay, great. You have to now print and frame this and get it up to Dallas. And I thought, oh no. <laughs> so printing it, framing it, drove it up to Dallas and everything. But this was one of the first ones I got from my series. Later on that spring, I entered um, uh, 10 different photographs from this series into an exhibit at the Roger Torrey Peterson Institute. The Roger Torrey, Roger Torrey Peterson, many of you know, um, does the Peterson Guides. And they have a um, sort of a foundation institute that ha that holds his work. And it's a small museum in Jamestown, New York. And last spring, I found a exhibit that they were doing there called Art That Matters to the Planet. And that spoke to me. I, um, I feel like some of what I do tries to matter. So I submitted a whole series from this um, avian apparition series. A crested caracara, brown pelican. Uh, uh, I think a great egret or snowy egret at Mueller Lake. Domestic goose. Uh, Roseate Spoonbill at High Island here in Texas. A great egret. Uh, Roseate Spoonbill. Um, I really liked sort of the very abstract nature of this. Um, and this one's going to be exhibited here in Austin um, at a, um, a show that's going to be uh, beginning in December. Um, so, so this doesn't have anything to do with birds or avian apparitions, but there's a connection with this in, in the next photographs. Um, about 18 months ago, uh, my wife and I went up to uh, Georgetown, Texas, and there's a, um, a sunflower farm there. It's called Sweet Eats Farms, and they have lots of things that they do there. And we went up to see the sunflowers. And I took this picture of the sunflower, which I liked. And on the way back, we went by a, um, a small um, park in Taylor, Texas. And Taylor is near Georgetown, north of Austin. And I saw a number of egrets. And they were flying, and I saw a whole bunch of them. And I went back and just found um, there was an egret rookery in the middle of this town in um, uh, Murphy Park in Taylor. So every spring, I go back to this egret rookery and continue my avian apparition series. Most of them are cattle egrets, but there are great egrets and great blue herons. So um, 
these were just all experiments with my um, avian apparition series. And I continue to, sh to shoot this. I, I, I love the different ways that this captures the motion of birds. Um, on my website, I've got a section called the art of flight. And I feel like a lot of these represent that art of flight. But I wasn't done with different ways of looking at birds. So at um, Mueller Lake, we can get close to the ducks. And um, one day I was there and the sun lit up the feathers on the side of this mallard. And I really um, was fascinated by the colors, the textures and the patterns of the feathers on these, on these waterfowl. So what I did is I began taking close-ups like this. And, and then I decided to, to play around a little bit with them in Photoshop and post-processing. And I don't do a lot, but the, these are examples where I do um, some interesting post-processing in Photoshop. So I get a little bit closer. And then to re-emphasize the color, the patterns and the textures, because that's really what I'm interested in. I flip that around and, and and um, reverse it and create these patterns in, in Photoshop and do that with different birds like this mallard or this wild turkey from the um, Rio Grande Valley. Or a gambles quail oop, from Bosque del Apache just this part, crop that, begin that, um, and flip that around in Photoshop. And I have fun doing this. I like the patterns. This is a, um, a white-faced ibis, I believe. Um, and this reminds me a little bit when I was, when I was young, I used to draw these sort of geometric diagrams that showed perspective and, and, um, doing that with these feathers um, is, is fun. So a couple of, or a couple of years ago, um, you know, in the summer, um, the birds were gone, but the butterflies were out. So I really began getting interested in, in photographing butterflies. Butterflies are not insects, they're self-propelled flowers. I love that quote. So we went out to visit the, the monarchs, not down in Mexico, but in the West Coast, in Pacific Grove, California, and in Pismo Beach. So we got um, the West Coast monarchs um, winter over there and traveled there to go to a wedding, but also down the coast to see the monarchs. Um, and then experimenting and playing with the ones here, Gulf Fritillary, which Linda was talking about earlier. Love, that loves her passion flower. The queen down at a Ladybird Johnson Wildflower Center. Pipevine Swallowtail. Gray Hair Street, also down at the Wildflower Center. Okay, Mika, painted lady or American lady or anybody? Painted lady or American lady? So I, I, I learned that the four eyes are on the painted lady. And then, since I was trying this with birds, what would happen with butterflies? So um, I wasn't on a tripod, so this was just handheld. But um, a queen was just slowly opening and closing its wing, wings. And this was a, a three or four shot in camera uh, multiple exposure. And then since I tried that with the bird feathers, I had to try it with the butterfly wings as well. So this brings me to um, a project that I began working on in COVID and I still work on it uh, this day. It, it's a passion project. Um, and I learned about it in 2018 or 2019. I read a book by Terry Tempest Williams, it's an author that many of you may be familiar with. 
she wrote a book called The Hour of Land, which was about the national parks. And um, we, I went to a reading here at Book People in Austin, and she read a, a passage which talked about um, words from nature that had been removed from the dictionary for children. So the, the Oxford Junior Dictionary, done by Oxford Press, removed words like acorn and heron, um, pelican and poppy from a dictionary for children. Because as they said, they were no longer relevant in children's lives. And they replaced them with things like um, voicemail and blog and MP3P or uh, player and cut and paste. And this, uh, this really moved me. It struck me. Um, and about a couple of months after I'd seen Terry Tempest Williams talk about that, I was out in Santa Fe at the Santa Fe Botanical Garden and a local artist had done an exhibit there called AWOL where he had planted um, six of these words in the garden um, because they were now abs absent without leave because they had been stolen from children's um, lives through um, the removal from this, the dictionary. In COVID, um, I worked on a book project and I did a book called Picturing the Lost Words where I photographed these different words that had been removed from the dictionary. And um, if I have a minute or two at the end, I'll try to show you that. But, and then I wrote some poetry, which I had never done before um, about these. But let me talk to take you through some of these images. So Robert McFarlane wrote about this and he has a book called The Lost World, which is a beautiful book um, for children. Once upon a time, words began to vanish from the language of children. They disappeared so quietly that at first no one noticed, fading away like water on stone. The words were those that children used to name the natural world around them. The words were becoming lost, no longer vivid in children's voices, no longer alive in their stories. So my COVID project was to photograph these words, acorn, clover, fern, heron, kingfisher, pelican, Poppy, Thrush, Violet, Wren. So there are over, you know, 80 or 100 of these words. Um, and um, I'm started a project with uh, members from Nampa um, to um, collect images of these words. I started an iNaturalist project for those that are familiar with iNaturalist to um, capture these words. And I'm working on a website now to um, include imagery of these words and um, books for children and um, organizations that help um, kids and families connect with nature and the outdoors. So I want to end and remind uh, again with uh, my quote from Rachel Carson, if I had the influence with the good fairy who's supposed to preside over the Christine of all children, I should ask that her gift to each child be a sense of wonder so indestructible that it would last throughout life as an unfailing antidote against the boredom and disenchantments of later years, the sterile preoccupation with things that are artificial, the alienation from the sources of our strength. And I hope that my photography can help other people find and instill their, their sense of wonder um, as well. Man, did you generate some comments tonight? <laughs> I'm definitely going to share the chat with you. Um, there was a lot of compliments, David, with not just your photography, but with your ideas. And um, I'm, I had never heard of IFM, but I think there's going to be there's going to be a movement all of a sudden um, 
<laughs> of us all trying it. I've got a yeah. couple. Ha- hashtag IFM and Instagram. There you go. <laughs> there it is. And they're going to go, what is that? Yes. Um, I saw a couple of questions. Let me see <laughs> if I can't get you to answer them. I think they're fairly. Um... All right. This is Carolyn. She says that she loves the in-camera multiple expo- exposures. How'd you do that? So m- most um, modern um, cameras um, have a setting. Um, I use a Nikon D850 um, mirrorless. I think most of the mirrorless cameras will have this. So there's a setting that's called, um, you got to hunt through your menus in your manual, multiple exposure. And what you do is you choose how many exposures you want. Um, you can choose settings about whether the, the the exposure is averaged across them. So um, a lot of those I choose like three exposures. You um, take three images and the camera combines those into one single frame. So you've got to look in, in your manual um, for the setting to do that. But most of them, I think, have a setting like that now and again you could do a lot of this in photoshop i just like doing it more in camera um yeah carolyn dig through your menus and and um i i bet you have it um okay so darlene's question is well first of all she says i'm gonna try ifm smart idea what kind of settings do you use for bird movement images because, yeah. yeah. So um, I, I I generally go manual, and I uh, set my shutter speed to um, an eighth, somewhere between an eighth and a twentieth of a second. Okay. Um, that depends um, on the light um, and how close the birds are. If I'm really close to a bird. I, my shutter speed's got to cranked up a little bit faster to get the code of motion that I want. Um, but generally, I'm, I am I go about um, one eighth to a tenth of a second there. And my aperture in most cases is like, um, you know, F20 or F22. Um, and I crank my ISO way down as low as I can. Um, now, obviously, if um, it's darker, um, I, I crank my ISO up, but one of the things I really like about this photography is I do it early morning. Um, it's cloudy. I don't need sun. Um, you know, in some ways, my best photographs have been a dark bird going against a sort of a flat gray sky. Um, so, uh, I, I kind of like it for that reason is I'm not so dependent on this magical quality of light to shoot some of these photos. I hope that answered the question, darling. I, I think it did. And if it didn't, darling, come back in real quick. Um, I like this comment, cause Christine, because I think um, she is echoing a few other people in here. This has been an exceptional presentation and you're such an inspiration in so many ways. David, this was beautiful. This was just a beautiful presentation and I so appreciate that you came and and took a chance on me and just said yes you'll do a presentation for us and it was is such a joy um Gail slipped in here and she, and she said that you know this was um an excellent presentation with great and creative ideas and she's really glad that you're photographing the nature words that have been removed from these children's books um that just seems so wrong on so many levels, but um, thank you for doing that. All right, I don't see any questions. I'm going to to properly thank you, and um, I sincerely thank you for you know accepting my message and and mm-hmm. not hesitating at all for you know saying you'd come and do this presentation for us. So so thank you, kind sir. Um, I hope that our paths cross. Um, you know, Austin is a big city, but sometimes it's not as big as you think. So um, right. I, pop, I pop up in the, the strangest places sometimes. But David, thank you so much. It was a joy to have you. And I hope that you join us um, uh, another time. Um, 
All right. Well, thank, thank you. And thank, thank all of you for uh, your uh, kind words and uh, for joining in. So, all right. Well, next week, Valerie Hoffman will be here to kickstart the holiday season and help you add a little sparkle to your photography in her presentation, Getting Creative with Holiday Lights. Until next time, go out and create something beautiful. And I hope that we see you again soon.